everybody who's joining in just now. Uh, thank you for attending today's I Am Online. Uh, this is our monthly webinar where we're focused on identity and access management and is brought to you by In Common and Internet2. My name is Netta Caligari and I am the In Common Community Success Manager um, here at Internet2 and I am so happy to be the host in this hour. We're gonna have a great time. We have some great presenters. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to our wonderful moderator, um, but just a couple of housekeeping things. We are gonna be taking questions and comments using the live Zoom chat function. So please, any thoughts, feedback, questions you have, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so you're going to learn a lot, but we want to make sure that your answers are question, or questions, excuse me, are answered as well. Um, so just be sure when you're posting a question that it's being sent to all panelists and attendees down in the, the Zoom drop down, um, or at least to all of the panelists just to make sure that they can see it. And of course, we'll also be recording this webinar. Um, so at any time, um, you'll be able to visit I am online uh, starting this week and you'll be able to watch anything that you've missed or if you want to check out a past recording, that's great as well. All right, so without further ado, I am happy to hand it over to Dana Brunson. She is our ex Executive Director of Research Engagement at Internet2, and she will be introducing our topic and presenters today. Thank you, Netta. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today's session is all about CI Logon, which supports federated identity and access management for scientific collaborations. We'll get to learn all about what CI Logon does with examples and recent work and collaborations. So our presenters today are no strangers to all of you, I'm sure, um, Jim Vasney and Scott Caranda, who are the principal and senior research scientists respectively at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Jim received his PhD in computer science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he studied high throughput scheduling algorithms for HT Condor. Jim has led the CI Logon project at NCSA since it began in 2009. He's also Deputy Director of Trusted CI, the NSF's Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Scott received his PhD in physics from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where he studied cosmological effects from primordial gravitational waves. So that sounds fun. Um, Scott joined CI Logon project in 2016 as a consultant and transitioned to become a staff member in 2020. He is also a principal with the Spherical Cal Group, a small consulting company focused on supporting higher education and research. And without further ado, I think I will hand this off to Jim to get us started. So thank you both. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Netta. You should see my slides and, um, and I'll jump right in. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. So as Dana said, CL Logon is focused on providing identity and access management for research collaborations and we've been at it since 2009, over 10 years of sustained effort to um, provide a service for log on to scientific cyber infrastructure. That's where the CI comes from. And our goal is to provide seamless identity and access management, allow the researchers to log in with their existing credentials so they don't have to set another password. Um, you get the, their name and email address as part of that identity, it, enabling that access to the uh, research collaborations applications as seamless as possible for that new member of the research collaboration. And so currently we're supporting over 12,000 active users each month from uh, over 400 organizations around the world. And um, it's uh, really great through InCommons connection through Edugain. We support international identity providers and, uh, and applications around the world um, with uh, uh, because research collaborations in many cases are international. So that's really important to support. And, and uh, in addition to just basic authentication, we support onboarding and offboarding flows, management of attributes, groups, and roles uh, that are specific to the research collaboration. And, and our goal is to do that in a way that's consistent across the multiple applications that the scientific collaboration is using. So again, that, that new postdoc on the research collaboration uh, gets enrolled in one place and gets access to everything, isn't, isn't having to sign up separately for a wiki and an, and an email list and, and a Jupyter notebook. 
And so to do that, uh, we have a platform that uh, uh, supports authentication from in-common IDPs, Edugain IDPs, uh, Google, Orchid, GitHub uh, are also uh, authentication providers. And uh, with that authentication, the uh, researchers are uh, onboarded into the user registry that um, uses the co-managed software. And then the different science applications that the uh, scientific um, collaboration is using can connect into that identity and access management platform using whatever interfaces are, are uh, most useful for them. So in some cases that's an X509 certificate issued by our certificate authority. Could be an ID token issued by our OIDC provider, SAML assertion from our SAML attribute authority, or uh, OAuth tokens issued by our SI tokens provider, or even an, an LDAP uh, query. So again, our, our goal is to make that seamless for the researchers who are um, adding new applications into their scientific collaboration and, and adding new collaborators. So to realize our vision over the years, uh, we have um, worked to align ourselves with the Income and Trusted Access Platform. Uh, I already mentioned co-manage being a, a real key component of our platform. And of course, Shibboleth is key for us for that um, federated authentication from Incommon and Educate identity providers. Uh, we also include Grouper now in our platform for more advanced group management. And we provide our services um, as, as hosted services uh, because in our experience, some of the software is a challenge for research uh, collaborations, research projects, both large and small to operate themselves. And so by operating a, a common platform across many of these projects, many of these collaborations, we can do software updates consistently across the, the different projects and provide um, expertise in these uh, different software components to the projects that are, are, are uh, using the, the hosted services and uh, helping the researchers focus more on their research and less on the identity and access management um, infrastructure. So, so we've been in production operations since 2010 and reliability and sustainability are, are really key factors for our service. Um, of course, uh, if, if you're going to rely on a hosted identity and access management platform, you need it to be sustained for the lifetime of your research project and, and you need it to be reliable so the researchers can, can log on. And uh, so our platform is all open source. Um, uh, I mentioned the um, in common trusted access platform components, Shibboleth, Command, and, and Grouper that we use. We also um, uh, use the uh, PIF and Satosa components from Identity, Pla Identity Python. We have some home, uh, homegrown components from the CI Logon project, including our OpenID Connect provider, uh, our OAuth SI tokens provider, our, our X509. Um, uh, certificate authority built on OpenSSL. Uh, we recently added support for SI tokens um, using um, OAuth JSON web tokens, and uh, also we use OpenLDAP for that LDAP support with support for the VO person standard for, for managing those um, virtual organization attributes there, so critical to research collaborations. And uh, so in terms of sustainability, the development of CI Logon over the years has been supported by NSF and Department of Energy grants. And uh, so uh, that's been really key for the, the growth of our uh, software service over the years. And um, also uh, over about the past 10 years, um, operational support from Exceed has been really valuable for our um, operational reliability that's included a good collaboration with the um, Exceed partner Nix um, in Tennessee, where they operate the um, secondary service instances for CI Logon in case we need to um, fail over from the service instances at NCSA. Um, the Exceed help desk is also um, uh, really key in monitoring the services um, and, and handling uh, support tickets, et cetera. So that's really valuable for us. And uh, so we've moved from a grant funded model to a uh, nonprofit subscription model for sustainability um, uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, that's been uh, motivated by our, uh, our customers, by the research projects telling us, we're, we're a little nervous if you're running this service just based on getting 
uh, three-year grants um, over and over again, you know, are, are you really going to be around for the lifetime of our project? Um, and so that, that was nice. Uh, that's an important concern for them to have. Um, but the fact that they're willing to sign up for subscriptions and help to sustain our operations was, uh, is really valuable because that's what enables our long-term sustainability. So as part of that subscription model, uh, it, it provides contracted service level agreements um, and uh, it, it provides uh, um, uh, a financial structure through the University of Illinois that um, uh, uh, has a process for setting our prices each year. Um, all the details, including the prices, are published on our website, um, clogan.org slash subscribe. And so we uh, go through a process each year with the university to look uh, and see if we're incurring a debt over the year and if we need to modify our prices. So we have, uh, over the years, made minor uh, increases to our prices, um, but always that's uh, that's uh, through uh, contract revisions with our subscribers and, um, and uh, always uh, in an open way published on our website. And it, this nonprofit model allows us to sustain the service while maintaining our focus on research and scholarship needs that are so central to uh, universities like the University of Illinois. Uh, and so I, th I think I covered a lot of our 10 year history already. Um, you know, we were inspired by some early work uh, for federated login to TerraGrid and then um, initially launched through an NSF ARRA award. And uh, so over the years, we've expanded beyond just um, supporting um, certificate issuance to OAuth support, OpenID Connect support. Um, when Scott joined in 2016, we worked on adding the, the co-managed support to the platform. And then uh, we, we fully transitioned to our subscription funding model in 2019 with the end of our, um, uh, our last NSF grant in 2018. Um, and so since then, um, we've added the grouper and Satosa support. Um, Scott will talk a bit about um, how we use Satosa. And uh, this year, we, we joined the new Income and Catalyst program. Really glad to be um, supported by that program, uh, getting a lot of good, uh, good interactions with the other catalysts. And uh, we added side tokens and WLCG JSON web token support that I'll talk about. So over the years, we see growth and use of the platform. So lately, we're seeing over 12,000 users per month um, active in the platform, uh, which with uh, some uh, some seasonal dips, uh, uh, you know, in December each year. Um, but it's nice to see continued growth of, of active use of the platform. And when we think about where those users are coming from, I like to look at the, the top 20 IDPs each month of um, number of unique active users per IDP. And so these are, this is the top 20 from June. And so you see identity providers from research organizations like NIH, Fermilab, Exceed, LIGO, um, uni uh, universities, of course our home university, University of Illinois. We have multiple applications on campus using CI Logon. And NCSA has internal applications using CI Logon. And um, so other examples of Universities that have um, Jupyter Hub installations, um, there are the Globus um, data transfer node installations, and other uh, other applications on campus that are using CI Logon. Um, especially like this uh, this, comp uh, this competition between Northwestern and Northeastern that's uh, that's heated up over the past few months to see who has more users. And so uh, at its core, CI Logon is a proxy service. And I think we're well aligned with this nice ARC blueprint architecture that I, I bet many of you are already familiar with. So CI Logon being a proxy that allows users to log in with um, identities where, wherever they can get them from Edugain, from um, social providers like Google, uh, into a proxy that can add attributes from community attribute services that provide more information about um, the, the researcher's membership and the collaboration. And that can inform authorization policy um, that can go into um, uh, JSON web token uh, authorization tokens. And then uh, providing uh, a token translation service as needed, providing those interfaces to the different services 
uh, if they need SAML assertions, X509 certificates, OIDC tokens, et cetera, so that the, the end services of the research collaboration provide a consistent um, identity experience for the researchers. And so this is more about the role of the Federation and proxy in words. Um, it's, it's really key uh, having that proxy for those applications that can't handle the complexity of Federation themselves. Uh, we see many applications can't handle thousands of identity providers. Um, you know, big services like AWS don't work well with thousands of identity providers. And so having a proxy that presents itself to the application as a single identity provider, uh, but behind the proxy is uh, those, uh, those thousands of identity providers from the federations is, is really valuable for these research services. And then it can handle the federation consistently across the many related applications in the, in the collaboration um, and uh, with targeted user identifiers handled consistently across the collaboration. And there's uh, multiple options for, uh, for implementing this federation proxy model. So CI Logon, we use the Satosa software. Another option uh, that's widely used is simple SAML PHP. Um, CI Logon is just one example of sort of proxy as a service providers available to the higher education uh, research and education community. Um, Edgy Teams in Europe is another example, and, and Globus, Globus Auth is another example. Um, and we have a, a good partnership with Globus in that respect. And so again, our goal is to enable the researchers to use their identities to, uh, to get onboarded into the research applications in uh, as, as seamless a way as possible. And so that means supporting the identity providers available through the federations, not just the campus identity providers, but as you saw in that top 20, the, the research organization identity providers are also really important for uh, for getting access to these applications. Um, this is in some cases researchers whose home campus doesn't necessarily have an Edugain identity provider right now, or the researchers just have a stronger affiliation with these research organizations. Um, and, and so it makes sense to use those um, research organization identities like your CERN identity or your Exceed identity. But also if, if those uh, identity providers um, don't uh, aren't available to the researcher, or the researcher uh, wants to link another identity to their um, to their CI logon um, to the CI logon platform, they can log in with Orchid or GitHub or, or Google. And, and being able to link multiple identities is really key for researcher mobility. Um, at when a researcher moves from one university to another, there's a good chance that researcher is going to stay in the collaboration and need access to the same applications and same data. And so having uh, having that ORCID identity linked to their university identity, when the university identity changes, um, that, that ORCID identity can uh, make that transition much more seamless. And of course, we, we do this all with um, the consent of the researchers, uh, always informing them about what attributes are being shared with what applications. And so this is an example where um, Globus is requesting attributes from CI Logon that includes username, name, email address, affiliation from the identity provider, and in this case, an X509 certificate. And it's, it's, this is a nice standard part of the OpenID Connect OAuth protocol where we can uh, provide this consent page um, on the authorization, uh, on the authorization endpoint. And so when the researcher sees that consent page, it might um, tell them that you're just, uh, you're, you're issuing an identity token. Um, that identity token may have some group information included in it, or it may be an access token for a more um, group-based authorization, uh, attribute-based authorization, cap or capability-based authorization. And um, We've been working in the side tokens project for the past few years to enable more capability-based authorization to scientific applications. We, we think that has a lot of good security and usability benefits. And um, that's been picked up as part of the WLCG common JWT profiles um, to support that um, capability-based authorization um, model. And uh, so now uh, when that consent screen is coming up, um, 
researchers can also see um, uh, where it's saying, oh, we're giving out, uh, this application is requesting a token to be able to do this specific operation on your behalf, access this data set or um, access this um, HPC cluster. We've got a couple of different ways of connecting OpenID Connect applications into the CI Logon platform. If, um, if you're just using the basic authentication tier of services from CI Logon, which is a free tier, then you can come to our um, registration form shown on this screen um, at uh, uh, clorg slash OAuth2 slash register, submit the details of your application, um, and we'll issue a client ID and a client secret to you. Um, we'll uh, promptly review your application and send you an email saying that it's been approved and, um, and then you're, you're off and running. Um, you have uh, control over what scopes your application needs. And so if, if your application doesn't need the email address, don't check the box, better to you know, have good data minimization in that case. Um, and so we do try to work with um, application owners when they're making that registration request to make sure that they're, they're getting the, the data they need, but no more. But then for subscribers um, at uh, other CI Logon tiers that include the uh, co-manage, um, we have a nice plugin to co-manage that allows, uh, allows subscribers to manage their applications directly in the co-manage interface. And so you see some screenshots here, um, where again, the, um, the subscriber can set the callback URIs for the application, control what scopes of information are being released to the application, refresh tokens, but also control uh, the um, claims that the application will receive based on information populated by co-manage by co-manage into LDAP. And so that's where the application gets access to um, collaboration specific attributes that could be collected through a co-manage enrollment flow um, and uh, allows a, a, a lot of um, uh, uh, more customization at that level doesn't require a lot of emails. Um, another key thing here is because this is uh, this interface is in co-manage as part of uh, the co-manage definition of a collaborative organization, it's not associated with a single person's email, single person who may you know, leave the collaboration after a couple of years. But this is it's an application owned by the collaboration and the administrators of that collaboration come, can come in and, and make updates to that registration through this interface. Subscribers can also manage their applications through standard OAuth APIs uh, as an alternative to using the, the co-manage interface. And so uh, here is just a listing of some of the different CI Logon enabled applications and sites um, that we know about. Um, and so if you, if you visit the CI Logon homepage, you'll see links to many of these sites. Um, and so I'm going to uh, quickly review a couple of examples, Jupyter Hub, um, uh, Pacific Research Platform is an example of Kubernetes. Uh, there's, um, there's a bunch of Science Gateway examples in this list, like, um, like Seagrid and Elrose Science Gateway. Um, and uh, uh, Globus is here in the list. And then um, uh, pretty soon I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who's going to tell us more about uh, Cloud Bank and Australian Biocommons. So I mentioned uh, Science Gateways. Um, these are web apps that enable uh, access to computational experiments and data management for the researchers. And so we've been supporting Science Gateways um, for, for many years. And um, in part, uh, thanks to a, a nice uh, multi-year partnership with the SciGap project at Indiana University, which provides Science Gateway platform as a service. Um, and then recently supported through um, an NSF grant called Custos to improve some of the identity and access management for science gateways. And a, a really nice thing about that platform is um, the, the researcher can um, log into Sci SciGap with their federated identity using CI Logon and request instantiation of a new science gateway using the Apache Aravatha um, software, customize it for their science gateway, and then enable CI Logon um, authentication to that science gateway then when it's running. So it's sort of used at, um, at multiple levels in the process. Another example of a, a really um, popular and powerful web interface to research computing services is Open On Demand out of the Ohio Supercomputing Center. Um, 
and as they say in their motto, uh, supercomputing seamlessly open and interactive HPC via the web. Um, and so uh, in our list, uh, we have multiple um, on-demand instances at, at different campuses. The software is very flexible, uh, uh, supporting many Apache HTTP authentication modules. Um, so it's not just CI logon, but you, you can plug in Shibboleth directly to the software um, or CAS or ADFS. Uh, but their CI logon support is through Keycloak, and, and we see that's being adopted by multiple campuses. Um, a couple nice um, attributes of that is um, they support identity linking. So you see here, you can log in with your OSC account, you can link it to your federated account through CI logon. And so then that gets mapped, your federated login gets mapped to the local account. And there's um, some nice flexible ways of doing that mapping in the on-demand platform. And so check out openondemand.org for more details about that. Uh, Globus is another example of um, a, a widely used application that um, uses CI logon for federated identity. Um, and so this is, uh, this includes your Globus data transfer node that is likely part of your science DMZ on campus. And so CI logon enables your, um, your federated login to that node, but also um, a, a growing number of applications are using Globus Auth to get OAuth tokens from the Globus platform. And so the, your federated login um, uh, uh, from CI Logon can enable your access to Globus Auth as well. Uh, we have multiple examples of Jupyter Hub deployments on campus that are supporting, uh, providing that um, uh, notebook interface to uh, enable researchers to share their code, their text, their multimedia associated with their research results. And so again, uh, CI Logon enables federated authentication to that platform. And with that uh, proxy capability, um, uh, CI Logon can enable uh, connections with uh, one IDP if your uh, Jupyter Hub installation is specific to your campus or many IDPs if, if you're doing a, a, a multiple campus collaboration. And lastly, I just wanna highlight the Kubernetes example uh, as part of the Pacific Research Platform at, at, um, out of UCSD. Uh, they've been really nice partners work, working with us to um, demonstrate how to connect CI Logon into the OpenID Connect support that is um, provided by Kubernetes uh, as part of the native Kubernetes platform. Um, Kubernetes is all about supporting containerized applications and so in this case, it's um, you know, containerized scientific applications. And so this, uh, for those of you who are really uh, familiar with the details of OpenID Connect, that includes public clients and refresh tokens so that when you register with the platform and you instantiate your containerized application, then you have um, API access to, to, um, to continue managing and controlling that application. Now I'm going to turn it over to Scott to talk about Cloud Bank. And while he's sharing his screen, I'm happy to um, address any questions that have come in. Yeah, thanks, Jim. There, while you're switching, there is a question. Um, is CI Logon security appropriate for HIPAA compliant apps? Oh, uh, so far uh, we have not had any cases of, um, of HIPAA compliant apps. So we haven't done any um, HIPAA agreement. So that would be something new for us. So at the moment, um, uh, uh, the, the answer to that is, is no, we haven't done it yet. Thanks. I think the only other question got answered in the chat. So I think we're ready for Scott. Great. Thanks, Dana. All right. Yes. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to assume everybody can hear me. If not, someone will message me quickly. We hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to focus on uh, two specific integrations that we've worked on. Uh, the first one is Cloud Bank here. Uh, this is a uh, project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. And as you can see, their goal is to help manage services or provide managed services to simplify cloud access for computer science research and education. So these are usually organizations that receive um, some type of award or funding that gives them access to a cloud provider and Cloud Bank will uh, help them um, manage this access. And this is a project that's um, jointly done by, you can see uh, California at San Diego and the uh, supercomputer center there, uh, also the University of Washington and also uh, Cal Berkeley. 
And they provide access to uh, manage access to uh, a couple different cloud uh, providers. Um, uh, I assume a few of these you will recognize. Uh, in particular, AWS, uh, Google uh, Cloud, GCP, uh, IBM Cloud, and also uh, Microsoft uh, Azure. So um, Cloud Bank, from the beginning, uh, decided to partner with Sailogon. And from the beginning, uh, this has been the way that their users uh, authenticate to the Cloud Bank uh, platform on the Cloud Bank dashboard. Uh, and so this is the screen that they present when users want to, uh, they browse to Cloud Bank and they click login, they get presented with the login with CL Logon uh, button. And then they are redirected to a particular uh, identity provider or login server um, selection screen, uh, discovery service for the experts. Uh, and you can see this is skinned uh, with the Cloud Bank skin. So that's something that Sailogon provides uh, for our subscribers is the ability to customize that. And as Jin mentioned, we have the uh, consent screen or you consent to attribute release. And after you log in to, uh, to the dashboard, you can then click on um, uh, a link to access your Cloud uh, Bank billing accounts. And that will take you to a page like this, where you are shown the uh, screen that details, you know, which awards you have in, in which cloud providers. And here's an example of my, my very simple test account, uh, where I'm given access to uh, AWS and to Google GCP. Uh, and then the, the login links are right there. And so, um, those login links are either in the case of AWS, that's an IDP uh, initiated flow. Uh, in the case of GCP, I think that might be, I can't remember that it might also be an IDP initiated flow, but we support both IDP and SP initiated flows uh, to allow the user then to get to um, uh, the, the cloud uh, provider and log in uh, with the credentials that Cloud Bank is, is managing for them, get them right into, for example, the AWS console in the right place. And uh, the way we do that is pretty straightforward using the CI logon uh, proxy capabilities. In this particular context, uh, this cartoon shows you the example of AWS as a SAML uh, service provider. And so we're using the CI logon SAML proxy IDP interface to federate with AWS. And so our users or the cloud bank users can flow in through in common. Uh, after authenticating, their um, details are passed to the CI logon SAML SP. Uh, after they're consumed and we know who the user is, then we can go ahead and we can look up users about, uh, look up details about those users in a couple different uh, contexts, um, we can query different types of attribute stores. Uh, and those could be attribute stores that are operated by the subscriber. Uh, in the case of Cloud Bank, we operate their attribute store for them. It happens to be uh, an LDAP directory. And so the uh, proxy can query the LDAP directory to pick up all those details uh, that we need to send to, for example, AWS to make sure that AWS or GCP or Azure, whoever the, the cloud provider is, uh, if you've ever done a SAML integration with them, you know that they require very specific, um, uh, very specifically formatted SAML assertions that don't always, in fact, never do follow the higher education and research standards that we kind of rely on in federation. Uh, so the proxy allows us to go ahead and actually customize the assertions in the way that those cloud providers require. Uh, and then the user uh, gets access to the service if they're authorized. And so we can also do authorization control uh, right at that point, as well as uh, downstream at the service provider. So this is now a set of standard integrations that we offer to subscribers. Um, so anybody who's looking for that sort of managed access to uh, those cloud providers, um, that's uh, just a crank we can turn now uh, that we haven't made available um, through the work that we uh, initiated for, uh, for Cloud Bank. 
The second project I want to talk about uh, is really different, um, but um, uh, very fun in its own way uh, and very engaging. Uh, so we have partnered with a project from Australia uh, called the Australian BioCommons, uh, which is um, supported by a grant and a funding agency in Australia. Uh, it's a pretty ambitious project. Uh, as you can see, that's sort of their, their goal there to support life science research with community scale digital infrastructure. Uh, and then importantly, developed and maintained in concert with international peer infrastructures. And so they really do have the goal that whatever they build, they want to make sure that it fits into the global picture. They're not interested in developing uh, solutions that only work in Australia. Uh, they know that research, um, uh, particularly in uh, uh, biology and health sciences these days, is global. And they really want to make sure that. Uh, anything they do will be able to federate and interoperate uh, with their peers in, in other countries. And their, uh, their target are the 30,000 life science researchers in Australia. So it's a, it's a pretty ambitious project. Uh, we've partnered with our friends uh, who we've worked with for a while and may be well known to some of you uh, in this community, uh, the Australian Access Federation. Uh, so sort of the Australian equivalent to in common. Uh, they've been around for quite a while, since 2009, and um, they've been a part of Edugain now for a number of years. And most, if not all of their IDPs are, um, are part of Edugain and so available through CI Logon. Um, can be chosen as one of our identity providers uh, during a, uh, authentication flow. So we started working with the BioCommons, and that's a big project, a uh, big umbrella. And it's always very helpful to have a specific target to work in when we're trying to drive this type of work forward. And so the first uh, initial sort of collaboration target that was brought to us uh, was this one. Uh, so the University of Melbourne Center for Cancer Research uh, is very engaged in uh, the BioCommons and wants to provide uh, federated access to their research resources. They want to get federated access to other resources. They really want to drive forward with this type of uh, global interoperable uh, federated uh, research. Um, but um, to begin with, they really want to focus in specifically um, facilitating joint access with the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. Uh, which is, as you see, Australia's first ever personalized medicine program for children and young people with high-risk cancer, um, which I think is just amazingly uh, fascinating. Um, I don't mean for this to sound glib, I'm actually quite sincere, but this, this is what gets me out of bed uh, in the morning to work with CL Logon, being able to, to uh, work with these guys and facilitate this type of research, I just think is an is a incredible privilege. And it's been really interesting learning about their workflows and about what they need to accomplish and seeing how we can, we can make that happen. Uh, so the first thing we did is we uh, provisioned them into the Australian BioCommons uh, registry, the CoManage registry. So CoManage, uh, as many of you probably know, is a multi-tenant uh, product. Uh, so we have a, a deployment just for the Australian BioCommons and then um, uh, UMCCR and Zero are tenants inside of that. And so we've got them set up uh, with their onboarding uh, and enrollment and their researchers are beginning to enroll and get onto the platform. And uh, what's been really nice uh, collaborating with the AAF guys is um, um, you know, the time zones don't work out very well for this collaboration. Um, but the AAF guys have come up to speed very fast on co-management, so they're able to really take the brunt of the work, do the brunt of the work, uh, sort of holding the hands at first for the people who are going to be managing their co-manage um, uh, organization uh, and getting them onboarded and really getting them started. Uh, so that's been fantastic, uh, so that I don't have to be up every day at midnight uh, working with those guys. 
after we got them onboarded, uh, we decided uh, we were going to focus on uh, this as our first integration target, our first real tool to uh, facilitate research. Um, so we focused on Gen 3 uh, Data Commons, which is a research tool um, being built by um, a very large collaboration, worldwide collaboration, but actually led by the Center for Translational Data Science at the University of Chicago. And so um, the BioCommons people brought us into this community a little bit and helped us uh, learn some things about this tool. And it, it appears to be a, a tool that has gained a lot of traction fast and a lot of groups uh, who do this type of research are beginning to uh, leverage uh, very quickly and contribute back to uh, evolving this tool. And so um, uh, because uh, uh, CI Logon, uh, supports OpenID Connect, and because uh, subscribers can then manage their own uh, OIDC clients, really manage their own integrations, uh, the first thing we looked at was authentication. Can we make authentication to uh, a Gen 3 deployment um, uh, federated and easy and streamlined um, so that uh, researchers from Zero and researchers from UMCCR can access each other's Gen 3 deployments. Uh, they both have Gen 3 deployments uh, in various stages of um, uh, deployment. And uh, it turned out, yeah, it, it was pretty easy. This is uh, Gen 3 um, is an easy tool to work with. It's written in Python. And uh, they already had, if you went to their documentation pages, they already had OIDC integrations for the big players, so to speak. Um, uh, Azure, uh, Google, of course, everyone starts with Google, um, Okta, uh, and a couple others. And so we said, why not have a CI logon module um, and make it super easy for Gen 3 deployers just with a few lines of configuration to go ahead and use CI logon as their OIDC authentication uh, identity provider instead of using Google. Um, obviously, we like the, um, um, the, the privacy details around Google a lot more, uh, I'm sorry, around CI Logon than uh, like those more than we like around Google. Uh, so we thought that was a great idea and it really didn't take much work. Uh, and we were able to go ahead and get the CI logon module merged uh, into Gen 3, and now it's just part of the distribution and it's part of their documentation. Uh, so we were really excited uh, by that. Uh, the work with Gen 3 and CI logon OIDC flows uh, helped us to address the authentication part. And so then we pivoted and began to look at authorization. And uh, the way that this community is addressing global authorization and interoperability is through uh, this group, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, uh, or GA for GH. And this uh, somewhat large group uh, got together and came up with this notion of an authorization and authentication infrastructure and something called the GA for GH passports. And so if we go look at their uh, OpenID Connect profile and look at this uh, definition of a GA for GH passport, uh, what we read is that this really is just a JSON web token with particular syntax um, that allows um, people to gain access to data. Uh, and in particular, if you squinted, uh, you would see that the uh, GA for GH passport looks a lot like a Psi token that Jim talked about earlier. And then we just did a little bit of digging. It was really fun to learn that the, um, uh, the Psi tokens community and the GA for GH community, they publish their papers about Psi tokens and about these passports uh, within a month of each other. So two very different groups who came up with very similar solutions and very similar syntax uh, to the same problem on how to manage uh, global authorization uh, to data. Uh, so um, that was exciting because uh, CI Logon uh, had done all the work already to implement site tokens, and it turned out it was not a lot of work at all to implement GA for GH passports. 
And so here I have a screenshot of what happens if you go to uh, one of our demo uh, sites uh, and uh, authenticate. Uh, you'll see that um, one of the claims available in the user info token is a uh, GA for GH passport uh, version one. Uh, it's encoded there, but it's standard JWT encoding. Uh, but if we were able to decode that, what you would see is that these are specific types of GA for GH passports. There's a couple different types. Uh, these are so-called affiliation um, passports. And so because I use the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign identity provider, and because it asserted three different affiliations for me, staff, employee, and member, um, see, I log on then uh, asserted three different GA for GH passports based on uh, each of those three different affiliations. And then if there is a downstream uh, broker or consumer of these tokens, uh, they can query, they can obtain these passports. And if they are using affiliation-based access, then this would allow the, the user to access a particular set of data that might be available from that resource. Um, as you might imagine, affiliation-based access is not necessarily the uh, access that a lot of uh, projects would use. Um, they might be more interested in, in uh, very specific uh, targeted access to very specific resources. And so now what we're working on uh, with UMCCR and Zero and our Australian friends is um, the mapping from co-manage uh, groups and roles to GA for GH passport. So that if you have a particular role manage through co-manage or you're in a particular group, then you will get access to very specific data sets through CA logon issuing very specific GA for GH passports. So that's the, uh, the work that we've uh, been most recently doing with that team. If you want to uh, play around with this, um, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you can go to uh, demo zero, that's not a typo, um, one of our very specific demo nodes. So demo zero.ci.login.org and you can go ahead, click the button, go through a flow and you can look at the claims and if your campus has asserted or your identity provider has asserted affiliation, then you should see these passports being generated, which again, aren't of particular use um, for any specific resource, um, but it's just a good demonstration uh, that CI Logon can mint uh, GA for GH passports now. And uh, we're excited about uh, all the opportunities that that's gonna open up for our subscribers. So I think that is it for my slides. And um, I'm going to attempt to stop sharing and hand back to you, Dana. Thanks, Scott. Um, so thank you very much. We do have plenty of time for questions. Um, and we do have some in the chat, so I will relay them. We have one, does CI Logon as a service offer either FedRAMP and then, I don't know, SOC2? if I'm pronouncing that right, compliance or some answer for us DOE national labs needs. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. That's a, a great question. Um, so, uh, so far, uh, no, we have not per, uh, pursued FedRAMP or SOC2 compliance. Um, we, uh, Brookhaven and Fermilab are CL logon subscribers, and, and we have had um, good discussions over the, the past year and a half with the DOE 1ID team. And um, so I think as, as those discussions uh, progress, um, I, I think it would be great for us to um, have some more um, you know, co concrete plans for compliance needs of uh, DOE lab subscribers for CI Logon. Thanks, Jim. Um, next up, as a service provider, is there a way to require or enforce multi-factor authentication with CI Logon? I don't permit off from IDPs, which do not enforce MFA. Yeah, uh, Scott's, I think Scott's looking at me. Uh, so, so the answer is yes. Um, it, uh, we can support it um, in different ways, however works best for your application. So uh, we can um, you know, let the authentication proceed to your application with or without the MFA attribute, and then you could look for that attribute and um, display an appropriate error message in that case. Or 
Um, and we can also configure on a per application basis a requirement that um, MFA is performed and, and either um, you know, return an error, authentication failed error back from CI Logon to your application, or in fact, just stop the authentication on a CI Logon error page. So, so we've got flexibility. It's certainly better for the user if they end up back at the application with details about who to contact and, and, um, and so maybe uh, some, some guidance about other identity providers to use. So, so maybe like if your campus doesn't support multi-factor authentication, the Exceed identity provider does support multi-factor authentication. So you might sign up there and, and use it there. Cool, thanks. Um, so I was just reminiscing in my inbox and I found the original email from Tuesday, November 9th, 2010 from Jim Basney <laughs> when I started my trek to get my previous institution to release the attributes so our researchers could use CI logon. So it's been a nice long journey. Um, but that brings me to one question that came up over the years to see what the answer is now. So what if you have compute resources and you need SSH access? So what's the solution there to, to use CI logon for us when using SSH? Yeah, we have tried a lot of different approaches to that challenge over the years. Uh, so uh, 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 some of you may have heard of GSI OpenSSH, which is uh, you know, and still uh, occupies some space in the back of my brain. Um, but, but thanks to our inclusion of co-manage in the CI Logon platform, um, we have a, I think a much, uh, a much nicer answer to that, uh, to that uh, uh, type of access today. Um, where we can um, get SSH public keys as part of the user's enrollment flow. We can provision cluster accounts um, as uh, using the, uh, the co-manage cluster functionality that, uh, that we talked a bit about in the chat um, and uh, provision public keys into LDAP so that you can configure your SSH uh, server to, um, to do authentication using SSH public keys into LDAP. So uh, we've, We've tried modifying OpenSSH in different ways over the years, and uh, really what works best is to just let OpenSSH do what it does best, which is public key authentication, and help the researchers manage their public keys using their federated identities. Did I, yeah. did, did I get that right, Scott? That's right. Absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I was just going to add, too, that if you, if you haven't looked at Open On Demand, I would do so. I think that's a really exciting, well, it's been around for a while, but it's certainly gaining more and more um, mind share and traction. And uh, even if you did look at it a couple of years ago, you should look at it again now. Uh, I think that's a, a very interesting solution. Yeah, good advice. I think maybe just one last question. Um, let's see. Oh, while well, using public keys for SSH, do you still enforce MFA? So that's really up to the, um, the the policies of the people who operate the the HPC system that's um, that's using SSH keys. Uh, it's certainly possible to include a duo authentication on top of your SSH key authentication or, or, or other um, second factors as part of that. Um, and uh, I know there's some some nice ongoing work in co-manage to support provisioning of the second factor of authentication as well as well that. Um, that can help to make that a seamless, uh, seamless experience for the researcher. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I think at this point, I'll hand it back to Netta. Thanks, Dana. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Scott, uh, for joining us today for that great conversation. If you've, anybody has any like super last minute pressing questions, please feel free to go ahead and throw those in the chat. Other than that, we will go ahead and wrap up our hour. So I'm going to share my screen screen here um, and just go through a couple more items before we um, all log off for today. So just to start, so if you have been regularly coming to I Am Online, um, you're probably familiar with our previous survey process. We did change it a little bit just to make it easier for you um, and everyone who attends to actually provide that feedback. It is very important for us just because it helps determine how we move forward with I am online um, and what your, you all of you really want to hear. Um, so when you close down Zoom, you'll just get a few questions that are gonna pop up and we highly, highly, highly uh, recommend and please ask that you please uh, fill that out so that we can take that 
uh, share it with the presenters and share it with our internal team, again, to make improvements over time um, and use that to drive decisions on uh, I am online in our monthly webinar series. And then in terms of what's coming up in the fall and what we have planned, I just wanna quickly point out that uh, camp is quickly approaching. Uh, it will be this, um, this October 4th through the 8th and it's welcome and open to everybody who would like to join. We can certainly throw a link in the chat there, um, but this is our uh, camp week in collaboration with Jayant. And it's just a wonderful, welcoming um, virtual event to attend. Really hope that you all can come. Uh, and it's really unique. So the first two days are really just about sharing stories of success, how to's, um, and you'll hear from all of our subject matter experts on what they have going on. And then the last three days of camp is really what we call our unconference. So you'll actually be collaborating with others in the space to uh, solve common issues and talk through common answers. Um, so hope that you all can make it and we really hope that we'll see you there. And if anybody did not throw it in the chat, I am happy to. So I am going to stop sharing here and I'll throw it in the chat. And then if there are no other questions, I think then we are wrapped up for this month. Um, we will have our next, excuse me, we will have our next uh, I Am Online on August 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So we hope that we'll see you there. Other than that, you can always reach out to us if you have suggestions, if you have any ideas around what you would like to see presented, we are more than happy to uh, take all of those recommendations. So again, thank you to everybody who joined today. Uh, the recording again will be posted on our I Am Online YouTube channel this week. And we will see you next month. All right. Thanks, everybody.